Um, and I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our um, annual Mark Swartowski lecture. This is actually the 25th uh, lecture. Um, so it's a special, um, special event for us. Uh, Marx was a distinguished professor at Baruch and the Graduate Center, and um, he taught here following his many, many years at, at Boston University, where he was an activist. I'm not sure about epistemic, probably. And, um, and also um, is, I just wanted to mention a couple of things for you, which um, maybe you don't know. He introduced this idea of historical epistemology. So there had already been a lot of discussion of social epistemology, but Marx wanted to uh, put a focus on the ways that modes of knowing change historically in, in fundamental ways. And he was very influenced um, by the writings of uh, Karl Marx and uh, ten really updated the notions of historical materialism in a, in a very interesting way, especially using a notion of artifacts uh, in his theory and the role of artifacts. So um, that was uh, an important uh, element. In addition, he did uh, with me the first collection on feminist philosophy. I think it was actually at his inspiration. We did the book Women and Philosophy, which came out initially as a special issue of his journal, The Philosophical Forum. And then he also did uh, the well-known um, uh, journal, special issue, it was, I think, the first of its kind, on philosophy and the Black experience. Um, I know that Tommy Shelby mentioned that at his uh, Mark Swartowski lecture, which was in person, and so I'm so delighted to have another finally be back in person uh, again here, though we also very much enjoyed Eva Kate's talk last year. Um, so uh, for the lecture, we really just try to um, choose um, great philosophers who are uh, carry forward Marx's interests, his spirit. He was very interdisciplinary. He's known for work both in aesthetics and in the philosophy of science. And he brought those together with a commitment to social justice that he introduced into his writing. And um, he also wrote uh, on Piaget and other issues in the developmental psychology. Uh, literature because of his interest in historicity and, you know, development and evolution of ideas. So um, with that said, it's my delight before I actually have one more thing to say. I wanted to th uh, make sure to remember to, you look at your watch. That's <laughs> Um, I wanted to make sure to thank a few people uh, we have here uh, joining us online, uh, members of the Mark Swartowski Committee, uh, John Pittman and Omar Dabur, and uh, later Lisa Dolling will join us. In that connection, I want to take note of the uh, un untimely passing of Bernard Roy, who was another member of our committee, and he was a doctoral student at the Graduate Center and taught for many years after that at Ramapo College. He made, uh, he was one of Marx's students and made a very interesting transition from being a chef at a Third Avenue restaurant to being a philosopher who wrote about the Port Royal logic. So that's just an interesting tidbit, but he was a really, really wonderful person, a great teacher and uh, we miss him. Um, so also thank you to Patricia and thank you to um, the various philosophers in our program that have helped us to support this particular lecture. Finally, I get to introduce Jose Medina, which is really um, perfectly fits what we're looking for in, uh, in this lecture because of your, the way you bring together epistemology, social justice, uh, political philosophy, and many other dimensions, including the critical, critical theory, critical social theory, and anti-racism and other dimensions of uh, thought uh, all of which were important to Marx and to me and others, of course, here too. That's why um, I'm, it's just great. So I recall I met you at Vanderbilt in various connections and uh, your work was really interesting um, to me then. Uh, and it continues to be, I know many students here have a very strong interest in your, in your own writing. So I, just by way of introduction, Jose Medina, Professor Medina is Wal Walter Dill Scott, Professor of Philosophy 
at Northwestern with affiliations in the Department of African American Studies, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Spanish and Portuguese. Is that all? <laughs> uh, so far. His primary fields I've mentioned, well, he's got it in his own words, critical philosophy of race, feminist and queer theory, applied philosophy of language, social epistemology, and political philosophy. You've published four authored books, five edited volumes, 40 journal articles, and 27 book chapters. I won't say is that all again. Um, your, his books include The Epistemology of Resistance, which I think you all know, with the subtitle Gender and Racial Oppression, Epistemic Injustice and Res Resistant Imaginations from Oxford, which won the North American Society of Social Philosophy Book Award. And speaking from elsewhere, and you have a new book, which you're gonna be giving us a little taste of, called The Epistemology of Protest, Silencing Epistemic Activism and the Communicative Life of Resistance, which is gonna come out from Oxford University Press. So with that said, please join me in welcoming Jose Medina. Thank you so much, Carol. Let me see if I have to turn this on. Is it working? Yes, okay. Please. I have to share the screen. Yeah, Actually, if you can help me with that. Sure. Yeah. Whoops, wrong, wrong person. Who's talking? <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, so I think it's that one. Yeah. Okay. Right. The clicker is not working, but. Why is, oh, yeah, yeah, now it's working. <laughs> why is it showing Jenny? Oh, because uh, I think we can change that. But. Okay. I don't know. Did you also click the minimize thing? The one on the left? The bar on the left and that with the top. Yeah. Is that okay? Better to go on. We want to show him. Pardon? They can see me? Yeah, they can choose what you see. Yeah, as long as you see me. Okay. You and I, Carol. I mean. <laughs> Not so good with technology at all. Okay, yeah, I'm horrible. Uh, so thank you so much, Carol, for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Patricia, for the help and, and everything. And it's great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's great to see friends uh, and to make new friends, I hope. So yeah, uh, I'm really honored to give this uh, a Mark Wartowski lecture. Uh, I didn't know him, unfortunately, but I got to see a little bit of his work and he, I heard some things from Carl and I really wish I would have met him, uh, especially when I was in grad school and I was starting to do things like epistemology and philosophy of language with a commitment to social justice. And I didn't know where to look or, or who to read or who could guide me. And he, had been, he would have been the perfect person for sure. But, it is so interesting that he has this notion of historical epistemology, because the way in which I think about contextualist applied epistemology is precisely, I think, what he meant by historical epistemology, right? Something that starts in the middle of social practices and tries to contribute to social practices, not only in terms of elucidation, clarification, but actually to, to say something critical about our social lives and to try to make a difference. So yeah, so I hope this uh, lecture and even beyond this lecture, my work is in the spirit of, of Marx. And yes, today I'm gonna talk about protest, silencing and epistemic activism. Let me announce from the beginning that even though I will say just a very brief few things about protest in general, as a communicative act and the kinds of felicity conditions that we can say that communicative act has, for the most part, I'm not interested today in protesting in general, the act of protesting in general. I'm more interested in the act of protesting or the attempt to protest of marginalized groups and how for people who have been historically oppressed and people for whom uh, there are communicative obstacles that other groups don't have, we owe a special kind of solidarity. So I'm gonna start highlighting that. What does it take for an oppressed group? 
what does it take for people who face communicative marginalization to go to the streets, to take to the streets and to be able to speak out and to have a voice that is understood in its own terms. So for that, the, the middle part of the talk will be all about silencing and I'm gonna be drawing from a speech act theory, but I'll also, I'm also gonna bring in the literature on epistemic injustice, talking about how these groups who have been marginalized face different forms of silencing that I'm gonna analyze, but also different forms of epistemic injustice. And I'm gonna say that in order to fight the communicative marginalization and epistemic injustice that these oppressed groups face, we have to engage in a particular kind of activism that I call epistemic activism. I'll tell you much more about that. So I'm gonna proceed in three parts. So the first part is just a very preliminary and general account of protest. And what does it mean for marginalized subjects to communicative solidarity that we owe to people, especially if they have been silenced. And I'll argue that we owe an enhanced form of communicative solidarity to marginalized groups. And I'm gonna suggest that the way in which we can discharge our duty uh, to support, help, uh, and stand in solidarity with, with those groups is through what I call echoing. And then in the second part, the middle part of the talk, uh, I'll give you the analysis that I already announced about the different ways in which uh, protesting publics can be silenced. And then finally, I'll talk about how to resist that. Uh, uh, I'll give this proposal about epistemic activism through echoing. Okay, so protest and communicative solidarity. So Frederick Douglass said, find out just what any people will quietly submit to. And you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. So clearly here he's emphasizing how important it is to disrupt people's complicity because it is because of the complicity of society that oppression continues. And in order to disrupt that complicity, we need protest. We need people taking to the streets, taking to the blogosphere, taking their voices everywhere. Uh, and also we need people joining in. And also we need people, even when they are deciding whether to join in a protest or not, to pay careful attention and to realize that if they don't listen carefully, and if they don't express communicative solidarity, especially with people who have been silenced, then they are tolerating that injustice. They are doing nothing to disrupt their complicity. So a protest is a very complex kind of communicative mechanism that can be used for many things. So I have there listed a few, oops, Number two in bold should be number three. I know how to count, <laughs> but I guess I don't know how to type. Uh, so there are, for example, these five things, right? Uh, these, these five communicative functions that a protest can have, just to voice public dissent, to give public testimony about an injustice. And I'm highlighting the third one uh, because today I'm gonna talk more about solidarity. A very important function of protest is to create, not only to express solidarity with a cause, uh, but to create solidarity, to forge solidarity. And notice how that is done in different ways, but in particular, it is done with the in-group, the internal audience of the protest itself, right? They are forging solidarity with each other, right? And that for Du Bois was actually the most important part of protest. We need to protest even if nobody listens, even if we're not gonna be giving any uptake, even if we know that we're not gonna move our contemporary society because we have to stand together in solidarity with each other. And that is gonna be a form of self-empowerment, right? So that's one really important form of solidarity. The second one has to do with social visibility, public support, uh, forming alliances with other people. So in that sense, it is also, protesting is also about reaching out to other groups and asking for their solidarity. And then of course, a protest is also a, a mechanism for articulating public criticisms and for making demands. And all of these things are typically blended together, right? It's not that people do one thing at a time. And they're all important. I'm gonna focus more on issues of solidarity, but in fact, as you will see, most of what I have to say is not so much about political solidarity in the standard sense, meaning endorsing the protest, endorsing the claims and the demands of the protest, but it is communicative solidarity in the sense of making sure that protesting voices are heard. Even if you don't agree or you don't know yet whether or not 
you agree fully with all the demands of a protest. I'm saying that when a protesting public has been mar communicatively, communicatively marginalized, you need, you have an obligation to express communicative solidarity with them. Okay, so this point about audiences I already covered. So first, when is a protest felicitous? Because of course, people protest in all kinds of ways and it's not clear that they deserve attention or that we have an obligation uh, to listen or to uh, uh, communicatively engage with them. Well, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew Christman and, and Graham Hav have recently uh, detailed three felicity conditions for acts of public dissent that I think apply uh, to protests as I'm gonna talk about them. The first one is sincerity. So if you have reasons to believe that the people protesting don't even believe what they are saying, then that makes the protest infelicitous. Acting and speaking in good faith, making demands in good faith so that you are not trying uh, to uh, instrumentalize the, the, the communicative mechanism of a protest. You're not trying to manipulate people. You are, you are really in all earnest trying to make a demand. And then finally, and most importantly, being guided by considerations of justice. If you are just asking for a special treatment, if you are just trying to hold on to unfair advantages or privileges, well, you may call it a protest, but it doesn't work in the standard way in which we think protest should work. And for that reason, for the third reason, it should be infelicitous. And the third one is in fact, probably the most important kind of felicity condition to talk about. And of course, the third one connects directly with the entire literature on legitimacy, right? Whether or not the protest is legitimate. So these authors, Christman and Hub, say if protesters are speaking sincerely in bad faith or not, well, actually this is not a quote, that's my own way of putting it, but they, they do conclude uh, that if they, if protesters are speaking sincerely in bad faith or not guided by considerations of justice, uh, then their political dissent, and this part is a quote, is a bad speech act because it, it is conducted in a way that is self-undermining and so is infelicitous. So what are the communicative obligations that we have towards protests in general, right? And then I'm gonna add the special obligations that we have towards uh, uh, protests and their conditions of communicative and epistemic injustice. Well, if the protest is a felicitous protest, we have an obligation to listen to it. We have an obligation to communicatively engage with it, right? And to make sure that the communicative engagement does happen. So this applies to all protests as far as I'm concerned, that's my claim. But then what happens when the protesting public is an oppressed public and they encounter unfair challenges to have access to the public sphere and unfair challenges to be heard in their own terms? Uh, well, what happens is that then we have also an obligation to fight against the silencing and the communicative marginalization that they face. And that means a strong form of communicative solidarity, right? that we don't owe to other people who don't have those problems. And I'm gonna argue uh, that the only way or the main way in which uh, we can fight against a communicative marginalization and the main way in which we can discharge our enhanced obligation to stand in communicative solidarity with oppressed publics is through a kind of activism that has an epistemic dimension. It's the kind of activism in which political action is at the same time an epistemic action, an epistemic intervention that tries to change the epistemic dynamics, the way in which people give testimony, the way in which people are interpreted and so on and so forth. I'll tell you much more about that. And for the purposes of this talk, I have actually a bunch of papers on epistemic activism. Two of them are already published and two more are coming out. Uh, so the notion is broader than what I'm going to present to you today, right? Uh, for example, I'm very interested in epistemic activism from the point of view of the activists themselves, right? And how they form a kind of epistemic agency that they didn't have before. They become a collective, they form collective agency. It becomes a form of epistemic self-empowerment. They trust each other, right? The Me Too movement, uh, women, victims of sexual violence, supporting each other, they form a new collective. Of course, Linda has an entire book on issues uh, of this uh, nature. So that's epistemic activism as well. In fact, I'm very interested in that. Uh, but today I'm gonna to talk about a very specific kind of activism that has to be done even if you are not fully committed to 
a particular political cause, or you're making up your mind as to whether you are committed. And that is the epistemic activism that has to do with making sure that people are heard, that they have a voice, okay? And I'm gonna say we can do that through echoing, okay. So this is a stronger form of communicative solidarity that we ought to oppress publics it involves not only giving them proper uptake when they protest, but it involves facilitating the proper uptake of others. And this is where echoing is gonna come in. When you see that other people, other groups, institutions are silencing or putting communicative obstacles for the voices of the protesters, then you should actually facilitate the proper uptake that they have not received Another way to put it is that when an oppressed group tries to protest under conditions of communicative, mar of communicative marginalization, facilitating uptake involves fighting against silencing and contributing to the communicative empowerment of marginalized voices. Hmm. I'm missing a slide, but anyway. Uh, so what is giving uptake to begin with? Uh, and then I'll say, what does it mean to facilitate the proper uptake of others? In my view, and there are different accounts, obviously, of proper uptake in special theory, it involves three things. Recognizing the communicative intention of the speaker or speakers in this collective of protesting voices, uh, but also, and that has to do with recognizing the illocutionary force, right? These people are protesting. They are not threatening they are, uh, the public or the institutions. They're not trying to intimidate the police. They are protesting, that's what they're doing. Then secondly, it involves recognizing at least minimally the communicative content, right? So that you have a minimal understanding of what they're saying, what the content of the act, the, the, the locutionary act is. And then finally, I'm also claiming, and here I have a stronger uh, notion of uptake than other people in the field, that you also have to recognize the intended communicative effects of the act, that they are protesting in order to achieve certain goals, to persuade people and institutions to make demands so that their claims carry weight in society. So that has to be there. If you don't do one of these things or none of them, then I'm gonna claim uh, that you are not giving proper uptake. And in many cases, the defective uptake may be communicatively marginalizing uh, the protesters or even silencing them. Uh, so now I'm saying that for oppressed groups, we have to promote a, a communicative solidarity and we have to promote uh, the, the uptake of others. And that is part of the epistemic activism. So that means along the lines of the three forms of recognition that I just mentioned proper uptake consist, you'd have to promote that other people recognize the communicative intentions of the protesters. You'd have to promote that other people uh, recognize the content of the protest. You'd have to promote that other people recognize the intended consequences. And that is what I'm gonna call those three things, elocutionary echoing, locutionary echoing, and finally, perlocutionary echoing. Okay, I'll come back to all of that. And for some reason, I'm actually using a, a short version of me, of my presentation, <laughs> which, no, it's okay, because it's gonna take long because I'm not doing it from my own computer. It's, it's okay, yeah, but this is not the last version, unfortunately. I hope the conclusions are the same <laughs> because I did change it a couple of times. It's, let me actually go to the conclusions to see. <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna give away the conclusions too, which I didn't wanna do. Uh, well, they're close enough. <laughs> we'll go with this one. Thank you, Carol. It was totally my fault. I, I think I, yeah, I have so many versions of this that I put in the USB, the wrong one. It's okay. Okay, sorry. I, that's true. I can type as I go. <laughs> All right, okay. Oh, wait, 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 I went too far, sorry. Okay, we're almost there. All right. Okay, so yeah, so I'll come back to all of that uh, uh, towards the end, but let me now give you a brief analysis of what I've been calling the communicative marginalization of protesting voices. And it's gonna have two parts. First, I'm gonna draw from the literature on epistemic injustice, and I'm gonna say that protesting publics very often endure forms of epistemic injustice. And then I'm gonna try to connect that uh, to the literature in speech act theory, 
and say that very often what is going on is that people are being silenced in different ways. And I'm going to recognize, identify different forms of silencing. OK, so first, Miranda Freaker's notion of epistemic injustice. Uh, so uh, as she puts it, uh, and here on this slide, I'm not departing from her at all. Epistemic injustice is the phenomenon of being brought as a subject of knowledge as a result of unfair identity prejudices. And it can happen in different ways, but two main ways in which that can happen is when, when people uh, are not given the credibility they deserve because of identity prejudices, and then that is uh, testimonial injustice, or because people are not found intelligible when they're trying to make sense of their experiences because of identity prejudices, and that is hermeneutical injustice. I'm going to follow this, so I still agree with all of this, but I'm going to expand it in ways that maybe many people here will not uh, agree with, uh, and that's okay. But I think it is important to expand it, at least for me, in order to apply this to different aspects of, uh, of the epistemic uh, uh, harms, the epistemic marginalization that protesting publics face. So the two expansions that I'm interested in for the purposes of this talk uh, are the following. Testimonial injustice, I'm gonna leave as it is. I'm not gonna change that much for the purpose of this talk. But for hermeneutical injustice, I'm gonna claim that it is a phenomenon that happens not only when you are unintelligible to yourself or to others because there are no uh, resources, expressive and interpretative resources that you can use to express yourself. I'm gonna claim that it also is a phenomenon that happens even when you have the resources, but you are not allowed to use them, right? Think, for those of you who know this literature, Gail Paul House's notion of willful hermeneutical ignorance, right? The resources are there, you try to use them, people don't let you, or they let you, but they don't give you the proper uptake, and then it doesn't go anywhere, and then there is an, an unfair credibility deficit that you have, okay? That I'm also going to count as hermeneutical injustice, but I'm going to go even beyond that, because I'm going to say that in some cases, what is happening it's not that people find your intelligibility defective or absent, it's that they find you intelligible, but they are making sense of your voice. They are making sense of your protest in a way that is completely contrary to your own intentions. Meaning by that, that, they, that they, they meet the sense that you were trying to make of the social world and the experience of oppression and the injustice is distorted, is actually erased, so that you are making a sense for a particular audience other than the, the sense that you wanted to make, right? I'll say more about that and I'll give you examples, but I'm saying, I'm gonna claim that that also is hermeneutical injustice. And then also I'm gonna use this other notion of epistemic injustice, which is broader than testimonial or hermeneutical injustice, which is what my colleague Jennifer Lackey and myself have called agential epistemic injustice, which has to do with your epistemic agency being blocked or diminished or subverted or marginalized in such a way that you cannot exercise your epistemic agency the way you want, right? So just to give you a sense of what this is about, uh, both uh, Jennifer Lackey and myself have been looking at cases of this in the criminal justice system. In the case of uh, Jennifer Lackey, uh, her main example is, is the extraction of false confessions. In this country, as you know, it is actually legal, believe it or not, uh, to use all these kinds of techniques of interrogation, right? So that because of fatigue, because you can interrogate people for days, because of the privation of food and water, also epistemic acts, because they are fed false information. And uh, there are all these ways in which you wait until the epistemic agency of the subject breaks down. You keep undermining the epistemic uh, agency of the subject until they say whatever it is that you wanted to say, right? And we're claiming that is a form of agential epistemic in, injustice, okay? And this I'm gonna use for uh, protesting voices. So what are the epistemic injustices against protesting voices? Well, testimonial injustices, uh, when they are unfairly distrusted, these are criminals. You shouldn't listen to them. They are saying that all police uh, is, to, uh, is racist, but that's not true. They don't believe in what they're saying. Hermeneutical injustices, when what they're trying to say is systematically distorted, misinterpreted, 
And then also agential epistemic injustice that has to do with various things, but including unfairly blocking, obstructing, or depleting the protesters' uh, uh, epistemic abilities to contribute to social discourse, to social meanings, to social knowledge. So now what I'm going to try to do is to connect all that with a Spishak theory. Let's see whether or not I can pull it off, especially with an old version <laughs> of my slides. And I'm going to identify four different types of silencing that can happen. So protest can be silenced, in my view, in four very different ways. The first one is the obvious, most intuitive notion of silencing, the ordinary notion of silencing, when people cannot speak, when they cannot protest, right? Preemptive silencing. And that is what I'm going to call pre-locutionary silencing. It happens before the locution because people are precluded from the protesting. But then what about if you live in a free society and you can protest and you do protest? Then you go take to the streets, do your thing, you protest. I'm claiming you can still be silenced if what you're doing is not perceived as a protest at all. If your elocutionary intention of protesting is undermined to such a degree that people don't even recognize you as protesting, but rather as doing something else, like rioting and looting or whatever it is. And that is elocutionary silencing, okay? At that point, you may think, okay, if people know that we're protesting, they were good. Not quite. Because even if you are on the streets protesting and people perceive you as protesting and recognize that you're protesting, if they completely block the content of your protest, and what you're trying to protest is not heard, there is a still on my view silencing, and that is locutionary silencing, okay? Now, at that point, you may think, well, that's the end of the story. We are protesting. They are recognizing us as protesters. They are hearing what we're saying. At least there is minimal understanding of what we're saying. We're good. I'm going to say that it's still not quite, because if what you are saying, even if, if minimally understood, is cut off from any possible consequence so that it cannot have perlocutionary effects, there is a still a kind of silencing that can happen. Okay, so let, and that is perlocutionary silencing. So let me tell you just very briefly, just a little bit about each. Prelocutionary silencing, how is that achieved? Well, the most obvious way, right, is by prohibiting people uh, to assemble and to uh, speak out in public. So, you know, all, kinds of prohibitions of freedom of speech, prohibitions of uh, public assembly are doing that. Now you may think, yes, that's why we don't wanna live in a dictatorial regime, we wanna, we wanna have a democracy. But notice, even in democratic societies like ours, there could be all kinds of constraints, the jure or the facto, right? So that even though you have the freedom to protest, the formal freedom to protest, it may be curtailed in all kinds of ways so that there could still be pre locutionary silencing going on, right? Even if it is not in any way constrained by laws or regulations, if there is a communicative and epistemic climate in which it is very, very difficult to say certain things and people become intimidated to speak up, right? Christy Dodson and others have talked about a smothering, right? Becoming a smothered the climate, the environment can intimidate you to the point that you want to protest, but you don't, okay? So this, I'm gonna claim, when this happens, results in agential epistemic injustices against protesters. For example, they may want to share their experiences of oppression and give testimony to a particular kind of injustice, such as racist policing, and they cannot do that, right? They cannot use they cannot exercise their epistemic agency. Uh, oh, and this was an example. Uh, so for example, I think uh, that in this country, for example, the way in which militarized police presence has been used historically, right? Uh, during the civil rights movement, uh, during the Ferguson protests, more recently with the Black Lives Matter uprising in 2020 and thereafter, well, that is a way of intimidating the public, like in this picture, right? When a protest has been called and nothing is happening during the day and you have tanks on the streets, it is a way, and on top of that, right? Uh, the, the police and representatives are saying there is criminal activity going on. People are intimidated and they may not go out. 
Okay, now secondly, locutionary silencing, that has to do with nullifying the communicative force of the act of protesting. So that you are protesting, but the force of your act uh, becomes neutralized. And there are many examples of that. I'm gonna focus on one kind of example. Think about this protest, right? The LA uprising of 1992, after the exoneration of the police officers who beat up brutally Mr. Rodney King, the Ferguson protests of uh, 2016, and of course, uh, the Black Lives Matter uprising of 2020. Notice one thing that is really interesting. I have their LA uprising, I have their Ferguson protests, which is already a way of recognizing this, that ha this phenomenon that happened was a protest. It wasn't until 2020. It was, I, I gave a version of this, a, a, a very uh, uh, primitive precursor of this talk, at a point in which, if you look up online, if you look Wikipedia before, 20, before the spring of 2020, there was no entry for LA uprising. It was the LA riots, right? And there was actually no entry for the Ferguson protests. It was the Ferguson riots, right? Wikipedia changed that in 2020 because public perception changed. And they were like, okay, we cannot keep saying, right? That these were not protests. And this is kind of interesting because not only the LA protests were silenced at the time as they were happening, the memory of them kept being silenced over the years, over the decades, right? And it took a radical shift of public perception, perception to uh, have this presented in a different way. And of course, as you know, one of the ways in which this uh, illocutionary silencing happens is through the rhetorical frame of rioting and looting, right? Through the stigmas of criminality, the racist stigmas of criminality so that people of color take to the streets, right? Traditionally in this country, right away you say, hey, they may be criminals. Maybe there is up to no good. Maybe there is ri uh, rioting and looting going on. And notice one thing, I'm not committed to saying Oh, but the, the, you're saying that there was no rioting and looting in LA in, 20, in 1992 or at Ferguson? That's not the point. Even if there is some violence and some rioting and looting, the fact is that if that eclipses everything else that is going on, that you don't even perceive anything else other than rioting and looting, then you're clearly not hearing that there is also a protest going on, right? Okay, and then there is a famous tweet by Donald Trump in which he said, these facts are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd and I won't let that happen. When the looting starts, the shooting starts, right? So clearly he's inviting American audiences to engage in elocutionary silencing of the protests that started after the killing of George Floyd. Notice also that in doing so, he's not only inviting people to elocutionary silence the ongoing protests, He's also trying to create an intimidating environment for protest so that he's also inviting people to prelocutionary silence future possible protests because he knew, we all knew, that this was gonna continue, that the protests were going to proliferate. Uh, so that's a, a, an example of that. Now you can think of elocutionary uh, silencing uh, on two different models. Uh, and I'm gonna mention what they are. I prefer the second one for a number of reasons. The first one is the model of elocutionary disablement that Ray Lanton and Jennifer Hornsby have developed so that you become disabled to perform certain speech acts. And I think that even though there is a very important intuition there, uh, well, there are also theoretical problems when you say uh, that people cannot even uh, do it, but also there is part of the phenomenon here that is not fully captured, which is that yes, in some cases you may say, when there is a locutionary silence and these people are perceived as not communicating at all, as making noises. They are not communicators, right? They have been disabled to a radical degree so that you don't see them as doing something communicative. But most of it, and that can happen, but most of the time you perceive these people as doing something else, not uh, protesting, but intimidating the police or threatening the public or, or right. And then the second model is more helpful with, with that, which is the model of, Quill uh, Kukla uh, under the heading of discursive injustice. And part of that is elocutionary flipping. Flipping a communicative act so that it is something very different from what it was meant to be, right? 
subverting the illocutionary force of the act. So as Kukla says, discursive injustice occurs when members of a disadvantaged group face a systematic inability to produce a specific kind of speech act that they are entitled to perform. And in particular, when their attempt result, when their attempts result in their actually producing a different kind of speech act that further compromises their social position and agency. And I think that that is precisely what is going on in cases of illocutionary silencing of protest. So here too, in illocutionary silencing, what is happening is that the agential capacities of a public are diminished, blocked, subverted, uh, and therefore there is a case of agential epistemic injustice. How about locutionary silencing? That happens when there is a systematic uh, distortion of the content of the protest, a manipulation of the content of the protest. So for example, Black Lives Matter, the slogan Black Lives Matter has been manipulated in all kinds of ways. And as you can tell, right, uh, the famous ways of responding to Black Lives Matter with all lives matter or blue lives matter are actually projecting a message onto the slogan Black Lives Matter that seems to be very different from the original intent. How is it that Blue Lives Matter is even a response to Black Lives Matter, right? It must be because you think that by saying Black Lives Matter, you are somehow saying that the lives of police officers don't matter. And of course, right, all lives matter. If you give that response, it's because you think that there's some kind of tension or problem between the claim Black Lives Matter and all lives matter. Uh, and this was uh, explained, let me go to this, uh, by, Lubel, uh, by a bunch of people. Lubel Anderson, for example, has a full analysis of this in which he says that what is happening in those cases is that people are blocking a particular interpretation of the, of the slogan Black Lives Matter, which he calls the inclusive interpretation, which should be the most natural intuitive interpretation. And that is the interpretation against the background of racism, right? against the background of black, last, black lives not having mattered. And then you say black lives do matter, right? So that interpretation is, for example, as, uh, as it can be glossed, uh, on, and I have it on the slide, black lives do not matter, or they have mattered less, and they should matter, or they should matter equally. So Anderson says, well, that gets blocked, so that no matter how you much insist, that is my self-interpretation of what I'm saying, that is rejected. And then an exclusive interpretation is imposed on the slogan Black Lives Matter, and then it is read as only Black Lives Matter, right? So that is locutionary silencing, on my view. And it results in a kind of hermeneutical injustice against the protesters. Not because they are found unintelligible, but the intelligibility that they achieve is not the intelligibility that they want, right? And also, I didn't mention this in the in the middle of the slide, the second point, that what happens here is not when there is locutionary silencing, it's not that you don't perceive the protest as a protest anymore, but you don't perceive it typically as a legitimate protest. So there is a communicative downgrading. There is no communicative erasure of the act of protesting, but there is a communicative downgrading. You are misinterpreting the protest precisely to show that it is infelicitous, illegitimate, and so on. Okay. Perlocutionary silencing. That happens when the protest, the act of protesting is cut off from possible communicative consequences so that it cannot carry the way that it should carry in public life. And that can be done in all kinds of ways. An obvious way, in my view, is through the creation of freedom of speech zones, right? Which is something very peculiar that started to happen in this country at some point, right? That if you wanted to protest, yes, you have your freedom, you can protest, but we're gonna take you in buses to these far removed parking lots so that you can you know, protest over there to your heart's content. So for example, in the picture that you have there on the slide, Condoleezza Rice came to Vanderbilt to give the commencement speech. And this was during uh, the Bush administration. Many of us wanted to protest. The university, the Nashville police, uh, they said, great, we're gonna take you, uh, you know, to these parking lots. And of course the media, would not reach us, nobody was there. We were just marching you know, and doing our own thing. Uh, so that is perlocutionary silencing in my view. There are other ways, right? More subtle ways of making sure that a protest doesn't have communicative consequences. And it has to do with obstructing the communicative afterlife of the protest act. Here, you can see how people use all kinds of techniques like discrediting, misinterpreting, uh, for example, in my view, at least, 
one of the ways in which you can make sense of uh, the platforms, the different policy platforms of the movement Black Lives Matter not having been engaged with is because people depict the platforms in such a way that they think, well, there is nothing actionable here. So in other words, this is what I'm saying. How is it that the DOJ report on Baltimore, the DOJ report on Ferguson, the DOJ report on Chicago, all of, the, all of those, right, didn't even address the demands of Black Lives Matter. They didn't even address this document, the vision for Black Lives. They say, well, they're, they're not saying anything actionable. Uh, defunding the police, abolishing the police, that, those are not actionable things. But if you look at the document, the vision for Black Lives, you have point by point all the actions that are meant by defunding the police or abolishing the police, including taking police out of high schools, etc. right? Well, that gets distorted and lost in such a way that the institutions say, oh, we have nothing to respond to, right? And this is part of what I call per perlocutionary silencing. And this involves agential epistemic injustice, but also in many cases, testimonial or hermeneutical injustice as well. So this is the picture that I'm trying to provide, bringing together these two different bodies of literature, that there can be all these different forms of silencing. And very often in correlation with them, the communicative marginalization and silencing involves also epistemic marginalization and epistemic injustice. And of course, I'm saying that we have an obligation to resist that if we want to live in a democratic society. It is part of our, of our democratic responsibility to resist these forms of silencing. And when individuals, publics, or institutions fail to do so, then you become complicit with this silence. Right? If you don't go out of your way to say, no, these people are not criminal, and no, they are not saying that only Black Lives Matter, and no, they are not saying uh, unintelligible, unimaginable things, they're talking about actionable things that you have to respond to and take into account. If you don't do any of that, you become either a passive bystander, or in some cases, you may be an active enabler if you are helping uh, recirculate these different uh, scripts and narratives. So let me go to the last part of my talk and I'll try to be brief so that we have plenty of time for Q&A. So I'm gonna just talk for the rest of the talk about how to resist silencing and the forms of epistemic activism that could be part of that. I'm not of course saying that all activism is epistemic activism, I'm not saying that. Uh, 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 and of course we need political action and political activism of different kinds, right? To make sure that people have a voice that they can protest. Uh, but I am saying that very often for cases of silencing and epistemic injustice, we do need political action that is at the same time epistemic intervention. A political action that has an epistemic dimension or epistemic consequences, right? So that we can have a public sphere in which everybody can be heard. And in order to show you what I mean by resisting silencing, uh, resisting the silencing of protest, I'm gonna follow the four kinds of uh, uh, the, the diagram that, that I just gave you, the different forms of silencing and say a little bit about how to resist each of those. Now, resisting prelocutionary silencing is not going to involve echoing because remember, prelocutionary silencing is preemptive silencing, right? When people cannot even protest, there is nothing to echo there because nobody has said anything, right? There is a lot of activism uh, that goes into that, resisting prelocutionary silencing. And I actually think that sometimes the resistance against free, uh, restrictions on freedoms of speech, uh, freedoms of assembly, take an epistemic form. It doesn't have to, but sometimes it does take an epistemic form. But then obviously the other three kinds are, of resistance, right? Resisting elocutionary, locutionary and prelocutionary silencing are gonna be specifically epistemic on my view. They're gonna have an epistemic dimension. Okay, first, resisting prelocutionary silencing. What, what does that mean and what do we do? Well, we have to denounce and fight against constraints and prohibitions on protest. We have to fight against inhibitory communicative climates. Uh, we have to proactively create opportunities to protest when that is difficult or illegal, right? And we have to change the communicative dynamics so that people feel comfortable and empowered to protest. And we have to change the specific social environments, right? And political environments so that people can do that. Now notice 
that a lot of activism is precisely about doing that, right? And a lot of activism is, a, is very creative, it's creating these ways of uh, engaging that even under the worst conditions, even when you are forbidden to enter the public sphere, when you cannot protest at all, you protest. Think about two cases, and I I'm gonna talk only about the first one just uh, for the sake of time. Two cases that are probably among the worst conditions that people have uh, for protesting. One is a dictatorial regime in which protest is illegal and has very uh, uh, incredible consequences, including in, uh, incarceration, in some cases, even death. And people still protest under those conditions, right? And also another kind of case, the criminal justice system in this country, incarceration. Because freedoms and liberties are curtailed to such an incredible degree, the criminal justice system has been created so that incarcerated subjects cannot do a bunch of things, including protesting. They cannot protest even the most basic things, for example, about their living conditions and their health and their well-being. They cannot protest, right? Not only in prison, but even in jails, when you are awaiting trial, right? You cannot protest. I mean, just think about what that means, right? Why? Well, if more than two people gather in the halls, that is illegal because that's possible gang activity. They are up to no good. They are criminals, even if they haven't uh, uh, been convicted of anything just yet in a, in a jail. Well, that's what I'm saying. Part of what has to change, of course, is to change those conditions. But for as long as those conditions don't change, there is all kind of activism that you can engage in so that you are changing uh, the, the, the public uh, the dynamics and you're changing the social environment and you're changing the social practices. So part of what you do as an activist, and I'm claiming that there is an epistemic dimension of this and definitely epistemic consequences of this, part of what you do is to reconfigure public spaces and reconfigure uh, social practices so that you do overcome your silencing and you do protest. So for example, this is the example that I have there on the slide. The Madres uh, uh, of Plaza de Mayo, Las Madres de, de la Plaza de Mayo, right, in Argentina during the dictatorship, during the military junta in the late 70s. They wanted to give, they wanted to protest and give public testimony of their loss, of their missing children, of their grief. They wanted to do that in public and they couldn't do so, right? Because there was a curfew and people couldn't take to the streets and gather and so on. So what did they do? Well, initially they said, well, we cannot just gather in the middle of the street because we're gonna be arrested immediately but it's still legal to go to the park. It is, it's still legal to engage in leisure activities like walking on the park instead of marching. So they did that, right? They knew that they couldn't do a sit-in in the middle of the street, but they could sit on a bench in the park and just do a sit-in there as if they were just sitting on a park. So they protested famously and that brought a lot of international attention that of course the junta was like, oh my God, People cannot use the parks anymore, right? A state of emergency, not even leisure activities, go home. So they went sent home. So what did the mothers do? Well, at that point, religious activities were still legal, right? So they crashed another party, right? They went to a pilgrimage, right? Uh, the, the Nuestra Señora de Luján, the pilgrimage of Our Lady of Luján, and they just, you know, walk in the pilgrimage with everybody else, but wearing their, their children's nappies as hair scarves, and they turn something into a protest, right? So that is how you fight prelocutionary silencing. And I had something similar to say, and not similar, but uh, I, I also had in this slide things to say about how you do that in prison. And I have an article that came out in Social Epistemology in 2021, but I'll, I'm gonna skip that for the sake of time. How do you engage in resisting elocutionary silencing? in all kinds of ways, obviously through counter speech. If there is an intimidating inhibitory speech, such as the one of Donald Trump that I, that I gave you as an example, that is silencing people, then you should engage in counter speech if you can, to create a different speech that neutralizes the in, intimidating inhibiting speech, okay? I claim, I have the intuition at least, 
that there are things in the recent literature in speech act theory, such as that article by Ray Lanton and Laura Capone, in which they talk about blocking presuppositions as a way of resisting illusionary silencing. Even though they are talking about one-on-one -on -one dynamics, they're talking about one speaker saying to the other speaker, why are you talking as if, right? Why, I'm gonna challenge your presupposition. I'm claiming that we can do that with groups and institutions, that we can do that with groups and institutions. And we can say, for example, to the, criminal, to the American criminal justice system, why do you assume that if people, incarcerated subjects gather, that's automatically activity that is dangerous and problematic, criminal activity, gang activity. But then also I'm claiming, right, that we can echo protesting publics and their communicative intentions uh, and support the exercise of their uh, communicative agency. And that means elocutionary echoing, simply by saying, no, these people are not criminals they are protesting, they have to be listened to, there is a protest going on. How about locutionary silencing? Well, we fight that in all kinds of ways. Uh, in, it involves fighting propaganda. So the work of Jason Stanley, for example, that may be familiar to some of you is relevant here, but also we fight against uh, systematic distortions by ideology critique. So in critical theory, of, for example, there, is, there are a lot of resources for this. In some cases, we may contribute to resist locutionary silencing by compensating for the deficits of the intelligibility that people face. Just simply saying, no, no, wait, don't change the slogan, right? And don't change the terms in which they are speaking. They're speaking in these terms, right? And then just finally, active listening so that you take the time and the communicative effort so that you display your communicative respect by giving attention and engaging with the protest so that you find out what the self-interpretation of protesters is and you try to echo their self-interpretations and that is locutionary echoing. How about resisting perlocutionary silencing? That involves making sure that protests can lead to communicative consequences, that they can have a weight in public life. And that means holding society and holding institutions accountable to protesting publics. So that means that even if you don't even know if you agree or disagree with Black Lives Matter and all their demands, which of course you can disagree with some and not others, if the Department of Justice keeps systematically not even addressing their demands, you should feel compelled to say, hey, we have a group here that keeps protesting for years, decades, and you're not responding to them. You have to respond to them. So that means echoing uh, calls uh, for reparative justice, echoing demands and steps uh, that are demanded for rectification of injustices. Uh, and this is part of what I'm calling perlocutionary echoing. So focusing on the last three kinds uh, of resistance that involve echoing, I'm claiming that we all have a prima facie obligation to echo those protesting publics that have been marginalized and silenced. We have the, and this goes back to the first part of the talk, right? The obligation to promote the proper recognition uh, of their communicative intentions, the proper recognition of their communicative contents and the proper recognition of the intended consequences of their acts. And just uh, to conclude, uh, let me highlight uh, three things first. And this is actually not a conclusion, it's a premise really, but it's there in the conclusion section. Uh, my premise was that we have a prima facie obligation to give proper act, uptake to all felicitous protests. So you have to listen to the protest if it, if it is felicitous. But then also when the protesting voices are silenced, then you need to give a special attention and to make sure that not only you give communicative attention, communicative respect and communicative engagement, but that others do and that the institutions do. And that involves expressing communicative solidarity in a very strong sense, for example, through echoing. On the epistemic side of this, right? I just put it in communicative terms. So let me now put it in epistemic terms. In order to resist the epistemic marginalization of silenced publics, we have a shared responsibility to promote the proper uptake of their protest acts through epistemic activism. And uh, that can take different forms, but it includes uh, what I have called echoing, elocutionary, locutionary, and perlocutionary echoing that is part of resisting 
the marginalization of oppressed publics. Uh, and that is a shared obligation. I haven't told you a lot about what I mean by that, but it is very important that it's a shared obligation. So we don't think about it as, oh my God, I have to do this. No, we have to do this, right? And we have to support each other in doing that, in making sure that silenced groups are heard. And I'll conclude with that. So thank you very much. So welcome back. This is our opportunity uh, for uh, questions. And we hope to uh, um, include the people joining by Zoom. So please use the raise hand function for that. And we're going to try to get as many people as possible. So not too long questions. And as following Michael's lead, and uh, we usually begin with students who might want to ask. So um, uh, OK, um, please give your maybe your name. Let's start with you. Uh, Tomas, uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about specific pain. I'm not sure if you'll find it interesting, but I'm curious what you'll say about it. So uh, sometimes in the call of the protest, arguably two uh, of the protesters actually get arrested if only to make it vivid that the state is oppressive in, cert in certain ways. So, for instance, a couple of years ago, the uh, conservative government of Poland tried to outlaw the usage of uh, the rainbow flag uh, by claiming that it offends religious feelings of some people and so on. So there was a high profile case of an activist trying to uh, stick a rainbow flag into a hand of Holy Mary, uh, uh, precisely in order to get arrested. And so my question would be if and there's of course the, the state official saw through it and said don't arrest this person by any means so this leads to this count, count counterintuitive thought that by issuing this order in a way the government silenced the protesters by not enabling the the intended uptake so i was wondering if you'd say that this is an act of silencing or not necessarily so uh yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to think more about that specific case. Uh, one thing that I want to say, I don't know if this is going to help or not with that specific case, that it, you're right that sometimes you have to look at the context, right, very carefully, because people are using all kinds of maneuvers and detours, uh, right, communicative detours when they protest, so that they may be saying things that they don't actually mean, for example, but that doesn't mean that they are insincere in the sense I was talking about. So you can say, oh, they're infelicitous because they don't even believe what they're saying, right? They may be engaging in political parody, for example. Uh, they, I mean, they, and as you said, this is more going to your question. Sometimes they use techniques also that have to do with having shock value so that they receive media attention, right? Uh, so that they, because they want to be heard. And that too can enter into a kind of dynamics in which things look a little bit skewed or, or it's not clear that they're following, you know, the felicity conditions or whatever it is. And then the same thing for the audience, right? If the audience is acting on what is being said, right? As opposed to what the intended message is, it, it depends. I mean, obviously when people get arrested because they are, they are protesting, that, that shows very clearly that it is a form of silencing. But I mean, some of the cases that I have in mind, for example, is that, well, as you know, during a, a queer activism, right, especially during the AIDS epidemic, a, all kinds of techniques were used, right? A, and sometimes, for example, a queer nation would use as a form of political parody, saying things like, oh, uh, you know, even though I have some uh, straight friends, uh, straight people are dangerous or they shouldn't be teachers or they shouldn't be, and they would mimic, right, the homophobic uh, discourse so that they look like they were engaging in a het uh, heterophobic discourse, right? But it was clearly a parody as well, right? Now you can say, well, what is it that they're trying to achieve, right? If they're using the rainbow flag, not because they, they are actually trying to express any message with that flag and not because there is a queer message to be expressed but just because they want attention or because they want to be arrested right and then in by virtue of being arrested they are going to get an attention 
right, you have to look at that dynamic, right? And whether or not in the end, they were able to reach the audience that they were intended, intending to reach, right? And whether or not it was a protest and a protest in which the protesting message was heard, right? But you're right, sometimes, I mean, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo knew that they were gonna be arrested eventually, especially if they were successful, right? Uh, the military who that were not, were, they were not gonna let them do that for very long. So yeah, you're, you're right that you have to pay attention to what the dynamics are. And depending on what the dynamics are, sometimes things that look like silencing may not be, and then things that don't look like silencing may be. I mean, everything, I mean, this goes beyond your question, but everything is way more complicated than I made it seem. So I have more to say about uh, silencing that is actually permissible, uh, even as an activist technique, but I won't get into that. We have a lot, yeah, I know. a lot of questions, which is brief. a good sign. Uh, so yeah, first you and then you. Oh, okay. So, We're using it for Zoom. So okay. They can hear um, well, thank you very much for, for your talk. I would like to ask you whether you have think uh, in cases in which there are two historical silence groups that are like fighting each other and that are saying to each other that the other group is trying to select, silence them. And I, I would like to give an, uh, a concrete example of that. Um, yesterday, there was this big march, big demonstrations in all the world, and specifically in Mexico, there was uh, this big debate between uh, trans feminists and trans exclusionary radical feminists um, discussing whether trans people can march, can um, be in the demonstrations of the 8M. Um, and for the other side, uh, trans feminists were discussing whether TERFs can could, uh, be present in, in, in the demonstrations. Um, and for the record, I think trans exclusionary feminists is wrong, but let's assume that, uh, that both of, of the groups actually satisfies the felicitous conditions for uh, a real protest. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, how do you decide between which has more right to talk or um, I don't know, like just how do you do this, the, the balance between the two uh, yeah. oppressed groups? And I think I have the, the intuition that what is happening here is that um, they are both are being silenced in two very different ways. So in part, the question is, is it compatible to, to try to resist what kind of silenc silencing mm -hmm. and who should be the political subject resisting this? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I, I mean, it connects with all kinds of complications that I didn't present, but they are part of my view because you're absolutely right that sometimes it's not just that there are these marginalized groups and the mainstream society and its institutions and particular pe people are silencing them from the outside as it were. Sometimes the silencing happens within a social movement or across, as you were saying, across social movements of liberation, right? It is uh, very often the case that in any organized social movement, as soon as the movement becomes organized and there are leaders and there is a hierarchy and there is a structure, that no, uh, it, not all voices are heard equally within the movement, right? And some voices are pushed to the periphery or some voices are not invited to speak, right? In the civil rights movement by arresting, uh, right? By arresting another uh, queers of color. They were welcome to put their lives uh, in the line, and, and to the, but not to speak, or not to speak about certain issues, right? Uh, gay, uh, LGBTQ issues, right? So that's a form of silencing that, ha that is happening within the movement, right? And that can happen even in a protest act. People gather, right? And then a lot of people wanna say different things, and some people are not allowed to pick up the microphone, right? And things like that. So there is that kind of internal silencing that happens within even the same group, right? the same protesting public. And when there are coalitions or forms of protest in which different publics, protesting publics uh, interact, 
there is exactly the dynamic that you're talking about, right? And sometimes it's very difficult to figure out how to resist every silencing without empowering one group at, uh, at the risk of disempowering and contributing indirectly to the silencing of the other group. So I think all of that is absolutely right. One thing that is not like, you know, a, the complete solution for, for all the problems that you're raising, but that I think it helps is what I call in, in my own analysis, uh, this is in, in the manuscript, it's not published yet, the commitment to the polyphony of a protesting public. If you are committed to the polyphony of a protesting public, you cannot right, prevent certain voices for, for, from speaking up. Moreover, I claim that every grassroots movement contain voices, in an indefinite number of voices that we don't know whether or not we have heard, and therefore we have to remain actively open to hear more and more people. Now this becomes also, how do you do that in the practice and so on? It becomes also part of what is at stake in the contemporary discussion about uh, on social movements about horizontal social movements versus vertical social movements. It's part of the discussion of Black Lives Matters, right? Why do some people insist that it shouldn't have a hierarchical organization? Why some people insist all the demands should be contained in the documents, even if they are in some cases contradictory demands? Reform the police, abolish the police. In part, it's because there is the commitment not to silence everybody, anybody, right? Uh, so, I mean, there is way more to be said. Now, there are other cases in which activists are, are explicitly trying to silence each other. Think about protests and counter protests, right? I'm all for counter protests. I have uh, also an article on count defending counter protest, uh, but you're right. In the counter protest, sometimes people try to yell louder than the protesters so that they are not heard. So in a way that's silencing them. I have a story to tell as to how I can accept that, but I won't tell it, yeah. We need more of a polyphony of voices. Uh, no, there's just so many people want to ask you questions, so. And we can, if you want, we can that. take more than one question Maybe at, at the time. end, but okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, you are next. Um, okay, cool. Uh, thanks, Professor, for the great talk. I have a quick question about semantic distortion. Um, and my question is related to um, this idea of locution, locutionary silencing. I was wondering if, um, at least when it, when it comes to like slogans, does it need to be like a consistently presented slogan in or that then gets distorted in order for it to actually be locutionary silencing? The example you gave, in fact, the response you gave to just now uh, is what I'm thinking about with Black Lives Matter, because um, I'm wondering about what happens when not the, pro uh, the lingo or the slogan or the symbol changes, but who's saying it? Um, so Mitt Romney in the summer, I just looked it up and he deleted it. This, oh. Well, uh, on Twitter it said Black Lives Matter. And a lot of people were really pissed that he, he of all people said Black Lives Matter, both on the left and the right. Now, in this example, he did not mean to silence. He was trying to actually take part in and he was in marches and everything. But people on the left didn't like it. And people on the right didn't like it. The people on the left didn't like it because, in fact, one of my friends said, well, I'm not using the slogan anymore because if that guy, who, if, <laughs> if this very radical slogan is now being used by yeah. the ruling class and it's not radical anymore. And the people on the right were saying, well, this actually makes it even worse because they bullied him into saying it. So I'm wondering about this um, issue about locutionary silencing when it comes to the depiction of just slogans and does the context you know kind of mean something here um yeah now that's a great question now being a contextualist of course i'm going to say yes the context <laughs> the context matters there tremendously uh, so no i agree with everything you said and, and you're absolutely right just because you are repeating the slogan even in its, without adding anything in its own terms doesn't necessarily mean that you are doing locutionary echoing, right? And showing this communicative solidarity that I was telling you about. So you're absolutely right. Now there are cases of co-optation, right? In which you are co-opting, right? The message and you are deflating sometimes the message 
or you are neutralizing the critical force of the message, even, you're, even though you're repeating the message. So during the, the uprising of 2020, I mean, not at the beginning, not the first week, not the second week, but when people realized that it had become so popular, we all started receiving emails or, te or text messages from companies, right? Uber telling you, we support Black Lives Matter, right? Now, clearly, what they're saying is, we want, your we want your business. We don't want you to go away, right? That is what they're saying. So they are not really doing what I'm saying um, uh, they should be doing. And you're right, it's absolutely the context and the communicative dynamics in that context that you would have to analyze to say, look, on the surface, this could look like echoing, the opposite of silencing, right? But actually it has silencing consequences of a particular kind, so I agree with you. Okay, I think I can open it and we'll mix it up. So I'll go to Miranda. Please use the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks so much. Well, wonderful. I, I, I agree with almost everything. Was one, there was one thing I found myself resisting and I'm now a little unconfident because it was an early slide. So to, if I'm just misremembering it, <laughs> I love, I think it's amazingly fruitful to apply speech act theory to collective communicative acts. And I would love the way you were sort of giving us a taxonomy. You seem to agree with um, Chrisman and Hubs about the Felicity conditions. And I, if I'm remembering correctly, the last one was that the cause must be just for a protest. That seems to be- No, 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 it oh. was based, I mean, it's close, but, but the difference does matter. It wasn't that the cause must be just, it was that the protest should be based on considerations of justice. Okay. If you don't have right. considerations of justice, uh. if you just say, you know, we are air traffic controllers and, you know, we have incredibly high salaries, but we just want more, right? Yes. Then that's not a consideration of justice. Yes. What if in fact you, so that does half answer my question because my worry was that we were building in too much ethical, political normativity into it's just counting as a proper protest at all. And I was thinking that there can definitely be bona fide protest for unjust causes. But now I'm wondering just to push it, could there not be bona fide, I mean, in the sense, actual protests for um, just expressions of interest where the people themselves want more, and in fact, they're right to want more, yeah. but they're not doing so for those reasons? Absolutely. So that's a great question. You're absolutely right that the felicity conditions may help as some sort of guidance, but they are incredibly tricky because people don't usually come out and say, hey, I'm being insincere and I'm not acting in good faith. And I just want uh, unfair advantages. I want to keep my, nobody says that, right? Uh, and you cannot simply say, I don't believe that you're being sincere if you don't have any reasons not to question the sincerity. And you cannot just simply say, well, I don't believe that you are oppressed, right? You have to show that they may say they are oppressed, but they are not, right? So you're absolutely right. There are hard cases, like the most obvious one is probably white supremacists char uh, marching on Charlottesville, right? Because maybe at least some of them do believe sincerely that they are oppressed. And maybe some of them do believe that they have a claim of justice, right? So that means if the conditions, at least on the surface, seems to be met, that means from my view, well, you have the obligation to listen to them, right? And even in some cases, communicatively engage with them. But if you have a strong reasons to believe that they're wrong, the communicative engagement takes the form, you are a white male and you may be oppressed economically or you may be going through a lot of things, but I don't see why, right? When white males still are overrepresented politically, overpaid compared to how other people are paid, when they still they hold the monopoly of the media. Well, I mean, you keep listing things to show that they are confused, but you're right, you cannot just, uh, uh, from the beginning say, well, you're so confused, I'm not even gonna talk to you, right? But, but you're right, I mean, the point is, and I agree with you, that it's very difficult to settle these felicity conditions. Not only the last one, the last one is the most difficult to settle, but even the sincerity, the good faith, yeah. Okay, um, so I'm gonna call on uh, an inspiration for this lecture, Michael gould Wartowski, Marx's son. He's also written a book on protests. What's up? Um, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Medina, and um, really appreciate um, the memorial lecture. I think Marx would have as well. Um, 
And I did, I did try to talk to um, the, the far right and the white supremacists. I studied the far right and I was there in Charlottesville in 2017. Um, and one, one is struck by the different treatment accorded um, cars that are uh, kind of running into crowds of people, um, you know, and, and truckers in convoys where they can shut down roads at will, whereas, you know, it's legitimate and legal in some states to target protesters' bodies with vehicles. Um, so, you know, given that asymmetry of power and, and um, legitimacy uh, for different kinds of acts, um, the legitimacy for violent acts by um, angry, unvaccinated white men, and the illegitimacy of other acts that are um, that we recognize as protest, but are not recognized as such um, by the agencies that have that kind of designatory or definitional um, power. Um, so I wonder if if those agencies or if those exercising this agency nominally on behalf of the public are the same ones responsible for both the repression of the protests. Um, or, you know, are enlisting other people who are outside of the state or in paramilitary organizations for the repression of protest are the same ones responsible for producing information or producing knowledge about what a protest is or when a protest is happening versus a crime, a riot, something that is arrestable or an, an offense against public order. Um, you know, that can vary from, from day to day, from administration to administration, and seems kind of arbitrary. So are we proposing to um, just replace those agents and agencies as the ones who designate and define what is protest, or are we proposing something else through this concept of communicative solidarity, which I think you are, but I, I would invite you to elaborate on that. Well, thank you so much. I mean, that's, that's, that's a great question. I think I agree with everything you have said. And I hope I didn't, I didn't give the impression that even though I'm looking at the communicative dynamics of a protest, I'm not just myopically looking only at what the protest says and does and how people immediately at the moment reply to it. Because it is true that there are all these structures, institutions, uh, processes that are going on at the same time and after the protest. So that is very important also how the protest is remembered. Right? What trajectory that protest or other protests or many protests can be put into so that we pay attention to whether or not people have been heard, whether or not something has been done uh, with their protests. And then you're absolutely right. I mean, this connects more directly with some of the things you were saying. It is incredible how the very mechanism of a protest is explicitly co-opted. In some cases, not just by publics, disenfranchised publics like the white supremacists, but also by institutions. Right, and structures, Coca-Cola making money out of protests, right? But then also how, as you said, how the police, how the military, right, may actually be uh, silencing one kind of protest, but invested in another kind of protest at the same time. So I agree with all of that tremendously. Uh, so this is only one small contribution to the analysis of protests. I don't mean to say that all if reactive activism against silencing is of the kind I, I mentioned. It's not that now we only have to do epistemic activism or, or, or all, all of that. We have to look at the institutions. We have to look at the structures. We have to look at the entire arrangement within which this particular act is taking place. But I think it's very important to connect uh, also all of this with something you were saying at the beginning. That yeah, in Charlottesville, there were people protesting, right? But there were also people assaulting other people with cars, right? And there were other things going on. And then, and also obviously in January 6, maybe it started as a protest, maybe even a felicitous protest going back to Miranda's concern, but then it became something else. It became an assault on the Capitol. It became an insurrection, right? Or even a better example, uh, well, of course, uh, those who protest against, uh, have been protesting for decades in this country in, in front of abortion clinics. Well, of course they are protesting. And of course, if they think, right, that an abortion is a particular kind of crime or violation of a right, they should say it. But notice what happened. They're doing, they may be doing that, they may be protesting, but they're doing other things as well. Namely, they're blocking the entrance to the clinic to people who want to exercise their reproductive rights. And when the police say, no, you cannot block the door, they are shaming and intimidating the people who go into the clinic. What does that mean? That at that point, even if there is protesting going on, there is intimidation going on. And at that point, you also have to stop that, the intimidation, right? And you have to make sure that that 
stops. And you have to do other things that are part of counter protest, but they don't look like the normal engagement in which people are listening to each other. Yeah, so it's only the beginning of an answer. But. Okay, I'll go back to this side. Yeah, you split the uh, microphone. I, I think in the back you, you had a question for a while and then we'll go to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, super interesting stuff. I have a question about echoing and I think you specifically mentioned echoing when you don't have full uptake, which I feel like is important uh, when you wanna support like a group. And a lot, a lot of times like there will be claims that you don't fully understand or something like this. Um, but then when we think about the felicitous, the, the conditions for felicitous um, protest, could they somewhat contrast with trying to echo something without full uptake? Are you in risk when you, so I, I have a memory of, of joining this protest by a group, like I, I believed in the group and it was about, I don't know, a group of teachers, I think in Mexico that were abducted and killed, something terrible, but I didn't understand a lot of the things around it. I was just like, I believe in this group. I think their claims are probably justified. Um, am I in risk of, of like being kind of an infelicitous protester because maybe um, by not having full, uh, full uptake, I, I'm, I'm not exactly in good faith because how can you really be in good faith without real understanding or, or maybe, I mean, I think you are still aiming at justice, but um, you might, the first condition, I slipped my mind, but I think also, Sincerity. Yeah, you might not be sincere if you don't fully understand. Like, is that, is that like a structural problem that could arise? No, that, that, that is a really interesting problem, especially for me, because in the analysis of uh, protests and protest movements that I am developing, I am actually very interested in issues of opacity, not only opacity with respect to other publics, but self-opacity, that self, the, the, the protesting public itself, because it is information, because it is a way of forming a collective with certain grievances and demands. And, well, that is happening, right? And you don't know, fully what everybody else thinks. And a protest is in fact, in that sense, an epistemic mechanism of collective learning, a laboratory almost, in which people are trying to share experiences of injustice and find out what the movement is about, find out what the protest is about. So there is that, that opacity even inside the protest. And you're absolutely right. If you wanna be a good democratic citizen, you know, and empower every voice and you walk around and you see that there are people who seem to be protesting, and then you see that there are other people who are trying to silence them in whatever way, either because they're saying they're criminals or whatever, and you intervene, right, going back to your question, but you don't really know what this protest is about, right? Can you really do the echoing and can you do it well? And can you find yourself in a predicament in which you are echoing something that turned out to, turn, turn out to be something very different from what you thought it was, and maybe something that it should not have been echoed at all. So that risk is always there. That risk is also there for protesters. You are not going to protest. You are not going to leave your house if you, don't, if you want absolute certainty, if you want to have absolute certainty and all the guarantees that you are not going to be part of something that you don't fully support at the end of the day, right? So there is always a risk in protesting. There is always a risk in echoing a protest. Now, all that being said, of course, I also think you have to do your homework as much as you can. So of course, if you haven't taken the time to find out what the protest is about, you should be very careful about that going, right? So I hope that helps. Great, thank you. We have a lot of questions. I'm almost gonna move to the collecting, but not quite yet. Linda, and please wait for the mic because people on Zoom will hear it. Great talk. Um, I, I want to ask you, to say more about the epistemic part of the epistemic activism, because um, you know, on one on one reading, what you're saying is you want to, uh, you know, you do a lot of great work to show how silencing works. Um, so you want to unsilence, um, and you know, I think that I you know can be read as part of your idea of polyphony that you have more voices and then more more likely to figure out the truth, um, that sort of an argument. But, um, but, there, but there is a question, you know, <laughs> but sometimes we do want to silence um, false claims that the, you know, that Biden lost the election or whatever. One example in a, from a movement is the claim, believe all women, right? Which is clearly a strategy of trying to unsilence 
um, to, to make a space for uh, women's accusations of sexual violence to get taken up and get taken seriously. Um, but, you know, but on the face of it, just, you know, reading it literally, it means um, all women's accusations are true. And um, I think 99.5% probably are, but, you know, but I think uh, if, if we, what's, you know, we need to think about the epistemic um, implications of that, um, that claim and its effect on the movement and the movement's ability to garner wide public support. Um, another example is um, uh, when people say critical race theory is being taught in public schools and most of the liberal elite media in the US is now saying they're such idiots. These people are such idiots. Critical race theory is only taught in a few law schools is not being, being taught in public schools. And so they're silencing the critics of critical race theory, right? By claiming that they don't know what they're talking about, they're stupid. And, um, you know, the truth is that what they're saying is true. There is more teaching about race and racism in the public schools. And that's what they're really complaining about. Well, they don't want that stuff taught in the public schools. So there is a truth content, I think, um, to what they mean by critical race theory is something different than what you and I might mean, but, they, but they're saying something true and they're opposing it and they're wanting to silence it, of course. So I just wanted to, to see if you, you might say some more about um, how the epistemic part of epistemic activism uh, works for you. Yeah, no, thank you. That's very helpful. So this is not an optimistic proposal saying that we, the more voices are heard, the more viewpoints are considered, the closer we're gonna get to the truth. Because clearly, I mean, we live in an age in which, you know, technology is being used to disseminate all kinds of conspiracy theories, right? So I'm clearly not suggesting that just because cons conspiracy theories are out there, right? And people are talking about them, our institutions uh, and ourselves have to dedicate time and, uh, and effort to examine one by one, right? To begin with, because we have limited time uh, and limited energy to do that. What I am saying is that if there are grievances based on considerations of justice, everybody should be heard or they should be at, le at least shown that they don't have a case. The problem, for example, with the, and I know there are different cases and this is not the only one you were thinking about, but clearly the problem with uh, you know, the theory that the election was stolen is not that we haven't heard the case or that it has not been, not been taken to the courts or that we have not waited for evidence to surface. I mean, that's not the problem. The problem is that no matter how much attention you give to them, right? they still have the claim that, right? So there is a kind of stubbornness there, right? That has to do with not accepting the epistemic game, right? Not accepting that evidence has to be presented, that reasons have to be given and all of that. But then going to other cases, I think you're absolutely right that in many cases, we're gonna have to be selected. We simply cannot, you know, spend our lives listening to all these conspiracy theories and there are constraints, right? There are epistemic constraints to public debate, including, well, people have certain burdens that they undertake when they make a claim. And when they call attention, they have to show evidence. They have to show something. You give them an opportunity, but if that opportunity doesn't go anywhere, I'm not claiming that you are committed to, I don't know if that helps, but I am saying that there are ethical uh, reasons and political reasons why we should be committed to polyphony and we should be committed to communicative solidarity, but there are constraints including, as you said, or suggested, Linda, epistemic constraints about objectivity and truth and, and, and having evidence or being open to provide evidence. So, yeah. Okay, I'll call on Patricia because she has to go set up the reception. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for the talk. Um, I was really interested in Yanai's question earlier and your response. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just say more about this idea of communicative solidarity as such, 
because it seems to me in the way that you were talking just now that it's a more diachronic category that it's one that's kind of cast over time and likewise this idea of communicative engagement is also one um, that is happening over time as you encounter a protest a group of marginalized people and you want to engage with them and one of the things that you might choose to do if in the context of silencing is this echoing activity but echoing isn't the end-all be-all of communicative solidarity it seems to imply a lot more um, I think your answer to Linda also was getting at that as well, um, you know, asking questions and engaging. Um, and if you're also from a marginalized group, seeing how struggles can connect, for example. So I was wondering if that if that's a, a good characterization of what you have in mind with this um, idea of communicative solidarity being a broader umbrella and echoing being an action that you do as part of that. Um, and if you could just say more, um, if, if that's the case. No, it is absolutely the case. So thank you so much for emphasizing that. So you're absolutely right. This is about group dynamics and collective shared, but also collective efforts uh, to listen to each other, but also they have to be sustained over time. So it, they have a crucial diachronic dimension. So we shouldn't be thinking that we all have to do it right here, right now. There are conversations sometimes that cannot be had under the current conditions. So, I mean, my inspiration to address some of these issues are, scholars such as uh, uh, Iris Marion Young, right? But also Audre Lorde and also uh, Maria Lugones, right? All of them talk about how difficult it is sometimes to have a conversation. And sometimes you cannot have it. Sometimes Audre Lorde had to ask the white feminists to leave the room so that the feminists of color could have other conversations. Uh, Maria Lugones talk about complex communication in which there are all kinds of attitudes, right, that people need to have, and sometimes they don't have, and they have to cultivate it and, until they are there to have the kind of openness to engage in a complex communication in which you become an ally of some other group, right? But you may not be there, or it, it may be impossible for a particular group to be there just yet, because we don't know enough about each other's history, because we haven't sustained this conversation long enough. So the diachronic part is, is crucial. And then there are within that all kinds of obstacles that arise, but also all kinds of uh, resources that we can develop and strategies that we can develop. And that's why I'm mentioning this particular feminist, because they have taught me some of these strategies. Uh, Maria Lugones, Audre Lorde, uh, um, uh, Iris Marion, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it is something very rich and very complex and diachronic for sure. One of the conditions is to have our material needs met, so you can go Absolutely. get get the uh, yeah. reception started. Uh, <laughs> oh, and now she's going to help. Don't worry. Alice is going to help. Uh, okay, and we had a question over here. And then I'll go back. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question was related to Miranda's questions. Uh, do you think it we could silence infelicitous protests? Um, my view is that maybe we should just not choose not to silence any context uh, protest. The reason, the first reason is, as you said, it's very tricky to uh, decide which protests are felicitous and which aren't. And the second reason is that um, I see that a common tactic to silencing these protests is to label them as infelicitous, as kind of um, motivated by ulterior motives. So why not just open the floor to everybody and then we can decide which ones are felicitous and which, which ones aren't? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, and that is part of my view, actually, that in some cases, right, you can use uh, the felicity conditions to say, hey, but don't you see that we're not talking about justice anymore? But in other cases, you have to let the conversation continue because it has to be played out. You cannot just uh, assume, right, that you have considerations of justice, but your opponent does not. So that has to be played out. But I, I think you're absolutely right. That is part of what democratic life is, but it's not at all easy, right? But in other cases, people are trying to abuse the communicative mechanism of protest. And then if you can show it, if you can say, no, but you're not even sincere, or you're not acting in good faith, then you, you have to show it. But showing it is a very complicated thing. I mean, it's not just appealing to this 
uh, principle and then you're done, right? It is, as you said, part of the conversation that needs to happen. And we have a question here. And then after that, I'll do the multiples. Um, hi. So I wanted to ask you, during your presentation, you moved past um, talking about prison protests. Mm. And I would love if you could like very briefly kind of discuss the ways in which prisoners are able to avoid the silencing of protests. Yeah, no, that, that, that is a great question. And that is something that I've been trying uh, to, to think about carefully. Because when I got interested in prison activism through some of my colleagues, through formerly incarcerated people I knew and so on, one of the first things that I was amazed uh, is to find out that, well, prison activism to begin with is prisoner, I mean, incarcerated subjects themselves, right? Engaging in activism, I was like, how the hell do they do that? <laughs> right? They cannot do it. And they do it in all kinds of ways, right? Supporting each other, right? Uh, uh, trying, in some cases, deceptively, right? Or a clandestine protest, so to speak, so that they are not perceived as protesting, but they are protesting. Or that they are doing something that the institution still allows, the carceral institution still allows, or that the prison, are, the, the prison guards are gonna disregard and it becomes a protest, right? And how do they do that in all kinds of ways? One thing that was very interesting is, figuring out how they form collective subjects within the prison system so that they could do things together because they cannot i mean that's one of the things that they cannot do right they cannot say because then they are perceived as being part of a gang or something well they do that in all kinds of ways but one way is through coordination so that if somebody had a grievance they would all file a grievance together right and inundate the system right so that I, and there is a particular a county jail in Durham, North Carolina, in, in which I did a lot of work and I, I was collaborating with uh, Matt Wheat, who was uh, one of the organizers of the Inside Out Alliance. And they, 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 they incarcerated subjects form a committee, they call it, the first five committee, in which they were trying to change the way in which they could air their grievances it's through coordination. But that means they became a collective epistemic subject that could give collective testimony, right? That means they were echoing each other, supporting each other. That meant that now the institution had to decide to disregard not just one grievance, but all these grievance that eventually got to the media and the town knew was happening. So it has to do with many things, but it has to do, for example, with epistemic self, what I call epistemic self-empowerment. When people cannot exercise their own epistemic power as an individual, Sometimes they can do it as part of a group, pulling resources, pulling their agency, and maybe they can be heard. So yeah, and in that way, they are transforming things that are going on in prison life eh, so that they are protesting, even though they're doing something that is supposed to be something other than protesting, yeah. I guess I would just want to interject a quick question of my own. Um, uh, in, I wonder uh, to what degree do the internal relations of the group have an effect in terms of the horizontality, for example, the democratic proceedings of the group itself, the justice considerations within the group. Can that help you at all with addressing the justice issues, uh, the justice kinds of justice considerations or the kinds of groups that merit our um, echoing? Yeah, no, How does that interrelate? No, that, that, that is a good question, right, because my view is, that not only right, a, a protesting public has to play a democratic game right, and, and protest in a particular way, a protesting public has to be committed to certain things that are also part of democracy, namely internal openness to hear people's voices. And you're right. And there are historical examples of that, as you know, in, in social movements. Sometimes you have a liberatory a movement that is internally acting in a very oppressive and problematic way, right? Uh, yeah, so I heard that's necessarily right. So yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so the, the person in red, you had a question for a while now. Yes. <laughs> Sorry to identify you that way, but it's better than alternatives, right? <laughs> red is neutral. I'm very much a person in red right now, so it's fine. <laughs> My question might be on point, actually. Um, so I was wondering, you stress very much when you talk about echoing 
uh, echoing the importance of um, listening, actively listening for and promulgating the self-interpretation of the protesting public. And um, that seems to be, and you make a strong case, very important to prevent certain kinds of silencing, right? But on the other end, historically, there seem to be cases um, where groups used like other interpretations of protesting publics, but that um, led to rather successful coalition building and solidarity. So if we think about the formation of um, the Rainbow Coalition under the leadership of the Black Panther Party in like the Chicago of the 70s, what seems to have been happening there is that the Black Panther Party members said, uh, said well, look, you know, the Young Lords and the Young Patriot Organization, you have all these protests um, and you don't say you're talking about racial capitalism, but really you're talking about racial capitalism. So um, we can build a coalition. So there it seems that the Black Panther Party um, imposed or at least suggested their other interpretation of the protests that happened and maybe in a different way and probably in a more problematic way but still in a way that was productive in some ways that happened with the communist party of the usa in the american south in the 20s and 30s right where they said okay all these black pro protests by black sharecroppers you know you're just protesting for your kind of quite local aims but really you're aiming at like capitalism and the oppression of what the Communist Party considered the Black nation in the American South. Um, so I, I just wonder, do you think this is like compatible with echoing based on the self-interpretation? Do you think there's a tension there? Or do you just not agree that those are actually productive cases of solidarity building? Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. I do think it is compatible with what I'm saying, but I also think that there are problems and constraints that, that have to be identified so that we avoid certain issues. So the short answer is, or the, the very <laughs> this, uh, truncated synopsis of what I want to say is that, well, of course, the slogans do travel, right, as you're showing, uh, and things that a particular movement or a particular group is doing may be beneficial for another oppressed group, for example, to use. But then, of course, it is at the same time problematic that another group may simply take the benefits of the communicative and epistemic labor done already by an oppressed group for their own benefit. Can they do that? Can they not do that, right? So Black Lives Matter, for example, uh, very quickly became a, a global movement, right? And the slogan is echoed in all parts of the world. And it's echoed sometimes by very different people of color. Sometimes it is modified so that what is said is, is not the exact slogan Black Lives Matter, but Brown Lives Matter or something of the sort, right? Now, as you know, there are different views about this within Black Lives Matter, but, and, and of course, some people are upset when the slogan is used in particular ways, but a lot of people within Black Lives Matter, right? And, and even today, if you look at the website today, right? The Movement for Black Lives is the website that I'm talking about, right? A, a lot of people say, no, we need coalitions, even though there is something tremendously specific about the experience of black people in the US, right? As a result of slavery, shuttle slavery, slavery and segregation and so on. And not all of experiences of black people in other countries is the same. And even though, of course, the experience of racial oppression of indigenous populations is very different. A lot of people within Black Lives Matter say there are respectable, responsible ways of building on each other. And if you are respectful too, the people who created that slogan, for example, the people who did the labor, right? And are in conversation with them. If you are in conversation with them and in a respectful way, you find a way of using or connecting uh, with their words, then I think it can be done. But you have to be very careful and there are limits to that, yeah. Okay, um, just I don't wanna silence our Zoom participants. So if any of you have any questions, now would be the time because we're coming to the end. Okay. Um, boy. Well, anyway, I would like, first of all, to thank Michael for his coordination and all of his help here, and especially to thank Jose for a fantastic talk and very generous um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Now we get to head upstairs to 7113 for uh, wine, cheese, other nice things, beer, even. <laughs>
And yeah, a lot of good stuff to eat and drink. And you get to ask your follow-up questions to Jose, who won't have time to talk, to, to drink. I'll leave this here. Yeah, so. Thank you so much, Monica. Yeah. Okay, right on time, right?